Welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast, episode 137. Today on the podcast, Jen talks about cliches, slang, and fillers, and how to sound more professional at work by not using them when you talk. Like, um, you know, stop talking like a teenager. If your boss wanted one of those, she would have hired one. Probably would be cheaper than you anyway. Hey, welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast. This is Jen Swanson, your host, and this is the podcast that helps you to get the job, to love your work, and to advance your career. So I hope you're doing well. It's very smoky where we are right now because our province is in the middle of a big forest fire season. Lots and lots of uh, people have been displaced from their homes and there's a lot of uh, evacuation alerts in towns that have been evacuated. And where I live, which is a fair ways away from the fire, we're, we're not as affected. However, the past few days, the smoke from those fires has come down closer to the coast where I live. And uh, and the air is just thick with particulate and thick with smoke. You can't even see the mountains. Everything looks sort of this brown, hazy color. And it's uh, there's a little bit of stuff in our throats because of it. So if I sound kind of croaky, that's a little bit why. I want to welcome you to this show if you haven't been a listener before, and if you've been listening to the Communication Diva podcast, welcome back. I hope that if you haven't had a chance to yet, that you will go back and listen to last week's episode where I was privileged and honored to interview the renowned Alan Alda, actor and author, about the the topic of his latest book, which happens to be about communication. We had a wonderful conversation, and I hope you take the time to listen. It's a bit longer of an episode, but it was so much fun to have a chat with him and to hear all the things that he is doing out in the world to help people communicate more effectively and more efficiently. So that was a lot of fun. The other fun thing that happened this week is that uh, the course that I've been working on very hard, How to Ace a Job Interview When You Haven't Interviewed in a Long Time, is now open for registration. It will only be open until August 7th of 2017 at the introductory price of $149. And then after that, it will be closed again until October. I'm going to talk more about it at the end and let you know uh, more about what's happening in the course. And I'll fill you in on all of that later on after we get to the content. So today's topic is called cliches, slang, and fillers. How to sound more professional at work. And I know I've done episodes on tone of voice before, but I want to talk specifically about words and sounds that we use in conversation that sometimes are not as professional as they could be. Sometimes we don't know what we sound like. Now, as a podcaster, I have the unfortunate experience of having to edit my shows, meaning that I have to listen to myself all the time. I have to go back after the show is recorded and take a listen to make sure there aren't too many big sounds in the background, to make sure I haven't left big long pauses, or sometimes I go in and I take out some of those filler words that I'm using when I'm trying to think. Words like, um... And, and things like that. And I know that I say, you know, all the time. And I'm not sure why I do that. But I am able to hear that because I have to listen to myself on a regular basis. But a lot of people don't have the opportunity of listening to their own voices, which is maybe a good thing because it's hard to do to listen to your own voice. But if you don't have that experience, you may not be actually aware of the words and the phrases and the sounds that you use in conversation. And sometimes these sounds and words and filler phrases and cliches can make us sound less than professional or less professional than we might want to sound. So in this podcast episode, I'm going to take much of the information that I'm going to share with you today from chapter six of the book that I wrote in 2015 called What They See, How to Stand Out and Shine in Your New Job. 
So I'm going to take some information that I've got. I'm going to take a look at tired old cliches that you can eliminate. I'm going to take a look at slang words that make you sound sometimes less intelligent, less capable, less professional, even if none of that is true. The words and the sounds and the phrases that we use can give the perception, and I always say perception is 90% reality, these things can give the perception to others that we are less than we actually are. So I want to help with that. I want to help to improve your speech, to improve the words that you use, to help you sound more professional in the workplace. So I'm going to be looking at at all of these things, and I'm going to jump right in. So the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is not true. Written and spoken words have real impact on other people, on the people around you. And so I want to take a look at how the actual words we use, that we choose, can make a difference to our professional image and to how people that we work with might see us. Language, as you know, is continually evolving. And words come in and out of fashion, somewhat like the clothes that we wear. Things that were absolutely acceptable once upon a time, like my really comfortable, bright teal green cozy tracksuit from the 1980s, (laughs) became completely wrong and horrifying not that many years later. I actually remember my daughter coming into my closet and saying to me, it's 80s day at school today, mom. I'm looking in your closet. And I was really offended. And then she found that tracksuit that I had tucked away in the very back of the closet because it was like pajamas. It was really, really comfortable. And I didn't actually wear it out anymore, but it was still something that uh, that I had. So I couldn't be too angry because there was something from the 80s in my closet. <laughs> Hairstyles are like that. Words can be like that too. Slang, which is meant to be playful, humorous, or casual, often happens with a spoken word. And it's not as commonly found in print, although it depends on what it is that you're reading. Slang is replacing regular words with something meant to represent them instead. And often slang comes out of pop culture. Using slang is perfectly fine in some settings. It's perfectly fine if you're texting. It's perfectly fine if you're chatting with a friend. But in a, in a professional workplace setting, it's not really a wise idea. Now, slang is not the same thing as jargon. Jargon is industry-related terminology that only the people on the inside understand. So in the medical world that I worked in for 23 years, there was a lot of jargon. There was a whole language of medical terminology, which I used to teach at college. And there were great big words that if you weren't on the inside, if you didn't understand medical terminology, you wouldn't understand. And so that's jargon and that's different. But what I'm talking about is slang, which is instead of saying hello, hi is actually a slang, although it's become so accepted that we use it now and it's become acceptable. But something like saying yo sup, you know, (laughs) which, you know, I don't know who says that anymore, but that would be instead of saying hi, what's up or what's happening, um, that would be a type of a slang. So you might be able to answer your phone like that if you're talking to a friend or, or, you know, your brother or something, but it's not appropriate at work. Sometimes words that we might think are in common usage for everyone are actually a form of slang and are not business or workplace material quite yet. So for example, the spelling of things, it's pretty rare now to see we'll see you soon on a sign if you're driving past a workplace, W-E apostrophe L-L see you soon, is not actually spelled out anymore. More likely, you're going to see the letter C and the letter U, right? So see you soon. And these things are replacing signage. They're replacing in uh, in text messaging because we're trying to do everything really, really fast. But it's not earth shattering. None of that is earth shattering or, or anything new that you haven't heard of before. But my point is that uh, that the slang, the local sayings, the things that we replace regular words with to be faster, um, these things sneak in to our conversation. And it's fine, again, in a casual setting, but it's not helpful or professional in a transaction with a client 
or with a customer or if you're doing a meeting or a presentation. This isn't the best way to get your ideas across. And these are things that people tend to remember. If you're in a professional setting and someone uses terminology that is less than professional, that is what will stand out. Definitely, it's not a good idea to use slang in any kind of written communication at work. So in any business email or any kinds of reports, because that that is uh, written down and it may come back to haunt you. Using texting words like LOL or using emoticons, those little smiley faces or, or cartoon characters are also inappropriate in professional correspondence, in emails, in presentations, in report writing, in the business place. So be careful with those. I mean, I use them all the time. I use little happy faces and little smiley faces with sunglasses. And I use them when I'm texting because I text a fair bit. And I use them in, you know, on Facebook and I use them on Twitter, but I'm not using them if I'm writing a report, you know, in my in my church setting, if I have to hand in the annual report, or if I'm sending uh, a business email in my business work that I do, if I'm corresponding with someone I've never met before, I'm not using that terminology. And, and you may already know that you're not to do that, but I'm talking, sometimes I'm talking uh, about the things that we don't even know we're doing. For some of us, these these shortcuts for texting and these shortcuts in communication and social media have become so natural and so common that, that we forget and we might use them in uh, situations that aren't appropriate and they will detract from your professionalism even though it has they don't have anything to do with who you are and how you how you want to be perceived they are communication. They are a form of communication. What about cliches? Well, cliches, and here comes a tired old one, everyone and their dog. <laughs> are you, you know, everyone and their dog. Now, I don't know about the grammar here. Everyone and their dog uh, is using a cliche of some kind or another. And no doubt you've heard that a thousand times. So there, I just used a couple of cliches. These are tired, overused, and often culturally specific words or phrases. People from other cultures might not understand the meaning of a cliché if they don't come from that culture. So sometimes these are local, sometimes they are culturally specific, sometimes they are specific to an area that you live in. And Clichés are also vague in meaning at times. They indicate a lack of creativity if they are used repeatedly. And, uh, and there are two types of clichés, the tired metaphor and the common phrase. So the tired metaphor, something like everyone and their dog, right? Well, you never hear everyone and their cat. That would be different. But everyone and their dog is a tired old saying. And, uh, and then there are some common phrases that become cliches. Here are some cliche examples for you. Better late than never. We've heard that. That's a tired phrase that has been said over and over and over again. Don't judge a book by its cover. We are on the same page. Thinking outside the box. That is becoming a tired one. It maybe isn't quite there yet, but it is has been used over and over and over again. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Cool as a cucumber. Never say never. It's a game changer. I'm really tired of that one. It's a game changer. It's a win-win situation. It's not written in stone. Only time will tell. Should I stop now? <laughs> I'm sure you can add some more. And if you want to pop over to communicationdiva.com under the, the show notes for episode 137, add some more. Or send me a tweet at Jen Swanson and the number two, Jen Swanson two. Send me a tweet with your tired cliches. You get the idea. And I'm not immune because I do use them and you probably use them too. And 
I'd be surprised to find someone who doesn't ever use a cliche, but it's not about that. It's when and how you use them, where and in what company that counts. Sometimes they just sound condescending. Sometimes you'll sound like your parent or your grandparent, which is okay if they're very cool people, but you know what I mean. I would suggest instead of using a tired old phrase or a tired old metaphor that's a cliche, that you dream up something unique, something novel to say. And here is a newfangled idea that will rock your world. If you can't think of anything new to say, then don't say anything at all. (laughs) Because sometimes saying nothing is better than using one of these tired old cliches. What about colloquialisms? That's a hard word for me to say. Colloquialism. These are like cliches, but these are phrases and sayings that are usually spoken rather than written down, and they're often regional in nature. And so for this reason, again, someone learning English, for example, may have no idea what you're talking about if you tell them that it's raining cats and dogs. That could be actually kind of frightening if you said that and they didn't understand that it was a colloquialism. I'm not going to be able to say that word. Um, Another example, um, hiring you for this job was a no-brainer. So, you know, what does that mean to someone who doesn't understand the language very well? This can be very difficult for people who are new uh, to the English language to understand. So in a casual, non-workplace setting with people who understand what you're saying, that's okay. But if you're in a professional setting, be careful of these phrases and these terminologies that you use. All right, let's go back to jargon for a minute. So jargon, as I said before, is a language that's specific to a profession, to an industry, to a trade, sometimes to a brand. If you've ever ordered a coffee at Starbucks, you'll know what I mean. If you're not on the inside, if you don't get it and you try and order a medium instead of a whatever, I don't even know. I I actually refuse to learn the jargon. But, But if you don't, if you don't uh, if you don't learn it and you're not on the inside, you might feel like an outsider. And so uh, jargon is useful and helpful if you're speaking with someone else who's part of the group that you're in and totally understands what it is you're talking about. And again, in the medical world, we used to use jargon on purpose because it was faster, it was more efficient, it was precise, it was very, very helpful to say I need an ECG stat rather than saying I need an electrocardiogram in a real hurry. It was just faster to say it and use the terminology and use the abbreviations and use the jargon. And actually, it was it was desired and required. But I used to teach my students, because I used to teach in the medical industry, I used to teach my students to make sure that if they were speaking to a family member or to a patient or to someone who was not in the medical world and not in the know as far as medical jargon went, that they use plain English because otherwise they were excluding someone. And you know, you don't want to feel, people want to save face. They don't want to feel dumb. And I've done this myself. Somebody will be blabbering away in jargon and I'll just nod politely and pretend I understand what's going on. Well, that's that's not communicating. If if you're speaking to someone and using fancy dancy words that you know they don't understand, then A, that's mean. Uh, B, it's showing off. And C, it's not being sensitive or empathetic to the fact that they probably don't understand what you're talking about, and therefore you are not communicating properly. So be sensitive to the jargon if you're speaking to someone who's not in your industry because you are excluding them or you're frustrating them or you're annoying them or you're confusing them. And it it could well be that you are miscommunicating with them and whatever it is you're trying to share is not going to get through. So it's important to remember who your audience is, who it is you're talking to. It will be far more professional to take a few moments and to explain what you're trying to explain in English than it is if that's the language you're speaking primarily, but to explain it in a non-jargon way so that the person understands. All right, now what about fluff and filler words? Well, an economy of words is a beautiful thing, something I have not discovered yet, as you know, because I am obviously a podcaster and a speaker and a writer, and I love words, and uh, I have been 
uh, told, especially when I was growing up in elementary school, that I talked too much. So there you go. But an economy of words is a beautiful thing. Sometimes we have pet phrases and little words that we use that we don't even notice anymore until someone makes us aware of them. And again, I told you about mine earlier. I say um a lot and I say you know when I seem to be when I'm podcasting and when I'm trying to think of the next thing I want to say or to explain something, when I don't have things all written out, I use those words and those sounds to fill in while I'm thinking, which is is not, you know, I'd like to get rid of that. I'd like to work on that. So those are some of the things I'm working on. But we all have them. I had a friend who, I have a friend who used to say all of the time, you got to understand, you got to understand. And that used to drive me around the bend because, there I used a cliche, because I I always wanted to say to her, do I really have to understand? Why do I have to understand? (laughs) I wanted to go off on this whole tangent. But she'd say, you got to understand. You got to understand that this happened to me and you got to understand. And it, it sort of made me feel defensive for some reason. And I don't think it was intended on her part. I think it was a filler word or filler phrase. I don't even know that she knew she was using that phrase, the way she was using it to punctuate her sentences. I saw a newspaper article once that illustrated this point really, really well. And it was about a now infamous young performer. I'm not going to use her name. You might be able to figure it out, an entertainer. And it was a word-for-word transcript of a really short interview that a reporter had conducted with her. And I don't have a copy of it anymore, and I don't recall the exact content, but this I, I have reimagined what it was like. I actually cut this thing out and put it on on the fridge at our house because we had four kids at the time who were were doing this. And I wanted to make the point that it sounded and looked ridiculous when it was in print and that it probably sounded ridiculous and made them sound less than intelligent when they did this very thing that this uh, singer star was doing. Okay, so here's my reimagined transcript. Reporter. So what is your next project? Name of star. Star. Well, like, I'm not really, pause, like, sure, because I've been on tour for, pause, like, ever, and um, I really need some time to, pause, like, relax, pause, like, you know what I mean? Reporter. Sure I do. Where do you generally like to relax? Star. Laughs. Oh, like anywhere. Mostly I like those, pause, Um, like all inclusives that have, pause, like all the food and like you don't have to do, pause, like anything, you know, that's how I like to relax. It's like really important when you work as hard as I do to pause, like cut yourself a break and pause, like chill. So whatever the interview was actually about, it went on for quite a while and it was really embarrassing even to read. I cut it out. And as I said, I pinned it on my fridge and I made gleeful references to it to the youngest members of our family who said the word like a lot. And, and we used to actually stop them and and make them, they, they would say something and they'd say the word like and we'd say like and, and interrupt them completely and they'd have to stop and we'd say, okay, start the sentence again and eliminate the word like. And we did this enough, it drove them crazy, but it did. we did this enough, there was lots of eye rolling, but we made the point that you don't need to use the word like as punctuation. We do it. I do it. Lots of people do it. It's become part of the culture. But if you wrote, write it all out the way this reporter had done this transcript, it really does make the subject, the person speaking, sound less professional, less intelligent, and just less. So it's a word I encourage you to eliminate, if you possibly can, in your professional speaking, in your workplace. Look for whatever the filler words are that you use. Look for the, you know, um, see, I just did it again. I said, you know, um you know. (laughs) I'm trying to get rid of that. These words are words we fall back on that are part of our speech habits, part of our way of speaking that we don't even hear anymore. 
and that can become annoying or that people can focus on when they're supposed to be focusing on the rest of the content of what we're saying. So do you have filler words that mean nothing because they pop into your sentences just because? I wonder. I wonder. And and the best way to find out is to record yourself speaking. Take your phone, take something that you can record your voice on, read something. Well, no, don't read something. You want to, you want to just speak, but speak, record yourself talking on the phone to somebody else, whatever. Find a way to record your voice and see what filler words, what filler phrases that you use and pick one and start to just notice when you say it. And eventually awareness is the beginning of being able to change a habit. Once you're aware, once you are aware of the word or the phrase or, or, the cliche that you are using, then you should be able to begin to eliminate it and use something else or use nothing in its place. Here are some common filler phrases to avoid. You gotta understand. Actually. So. Listen. Have you ever heard someone say that? Listen. Blah, 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 blah. Now listen. Blah, 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 blah. As you can imagine. Really. Like, well, seriously, I mean, now sometimes I do that too. I mean, sometimes I do that too. You know, you know, I got to tell you, as you can see, needless to say, I guess, literally, and interesting. Now, all of these words can be used legitimately as real words and phrases not as filler words and as punctuation. So they're all legitimate sayings, but sometimes they get overused. And it's interesting to pay attention to how you use filler words and how you can limit their use. Sometimes these things come out when we're most nervous. Filler words can make an otherwise normal sentence sound messy and long-winded and can make the speaker sound like they are lacking in confidence, incompetent, or confused. And presentations can take twice as long to finish if they're peppered with filler words and phrases. The audience might wonder if the person really knows what they're doing because filler words and phrases can give a loud and clear message of inexperience. Some of the words sound weak or simply used as padding and don't mean anything at all. These filler words can sometimes end up in our written communication too. And filler words can totally annoy people, which isn't good when you're trying to impress them with your professionalism. So here's an example of how filler words might pad a sentence. I'm going to read a sentence, uh, I'm going to read a paragraph to you, and then I'm going to Take all of the filler out and read the very same sentence and you'll, you can see the difference. Okay, so here we go. A manager asks an employee a question about finances during a presentation at a meeting. She catches the employee off guard. The employee looks for the information and says, um, sure, right, let me just see. Seriously, you got to understand, I just put this stuff together this morning, so, um... So yeah, here it is. If you actually look at the actual figures, you'll see that we are actually kind of doing okay. Now, that's an exaggerated example, of course, but it's a good example. So here's what happens if you strip away all the filler. The manager asks an employee a question about finances during a presentation at a meeting. She catches the employee off guard. The employee looks for the information and says, Sure, I just put this stuff together this morning. Here it is. If you look at the actual figures, you'll see that we are doing okay. See the difference? It's exactly the same, except I took out the pausing words, the filler words, and uh, and the filler phrases. It's the same word, the same sentence. Okay. See, I just did that. I said, okay. (laughs) Which of those two responses would you have trusted? Which of those two responses would give you the confidence that the person knew what they were talking about? The problem with filler words and pet phrases is that we, again, usually don't know we're saying them until we hear our voices recorded or until someone else points them out to us, which is usually hard to hear. Filler words are weak 
They can be wimpy. They can be waffling phrases that give messages to other people that you are not confident, that you're not capable, that you're not competent. And these can be completely incorrect messages. But using these kinds of phrases and terms on a consistent basis, I'm not talking about once in a while, but on a consistent basis, can give the wrong message. So my suggestion is if you want to eliminate extra unnecessary words in your speech, as I said at the beginning, was to record yourself, to find a way to record yourself, to notice every time you use a particular phrase. You might even want to record yourself and write out the transcript. I don't know if you can get one of those programs that will automatically do that for you on on the computer, but write out the transcript of what it is that you said and highlight, go back with an old-fashioned highlighter and highlight all of the filler words. Pick one and then start working on it. Nobody has to know what you're doing. But to change the way you sound in a professional setting, this is a very good exercise that doesn't cost you anything but time to record yourself, to listen to notice the words, and then choose a word or a phrase or or something that you use over and over again that annoys you, because if it annoys you, it probably annoys someone else, and then choose that and work on it and eliminate it. Take a month, eliminate it. Every time you catch yourself saying it, notice. And the more you notice, the less you'll be using it. And if you tackle one thing at a time, eventually the words will be gone and you will sound like the intelligent, articulate individual that you actually are. So that is my message for today. Thank you very much for listening to me going on and on about that. (laughs) I hope it was helpful and I hope that you can take some action to clean up the words that you use and the cliches and the jargon and, and the filler and come across as a more professional person in the workplace if that is what you desire to do. So that's it for this episode. I want to remind you about the course that is open for registration just until August 7th of 2017. And it is how to ace a job interview when you haven't interviewed in a long time. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. This is going to save you time and save you stress and get you up to speed in the interview process. The course is a video-based course. It has several different sections. There are downloadable worksheets for you to, to work on as well. And the course will help you to learn a number of different things. It is going to teach you what's essential to cover before you ever get into your job interview. So all of the things that you need to do before you go to a job interview. It will help you to Uh, know what to be ready for and what employers are actually looking for that they don't ever tell you about. You will learn how not to make the most common mistakes that interviewees make that wreck their chances of getting a job offer. You will learn how to build inner confidence and how to get rid of nervousness before going into the interview room and maybe getting rid of nervousness forever. You will learn how and when to follow up after the interview. And you're going to learn more tips and tricks to help you stand out and shine above the rest. You're going to learn about automated tracking systems. You're going to learn about video interviewing. There are all sorts of digital things that have come onto the interview scene that uh, if you haven't interviewed in a while, you might not know about. So I'm going to help you get ready for any and all of those eventualities and, uh, and, and get you up to speed so that you can walk in confident and you can ace that job interview. Registration again is open until August 7th, 2017. And there are lots of uh, good testimonials on the website over at courses.communicationdiva.com. If you go to courses dot communication diva.com you will find the how to ace your job interview little little picture and box click on that and it will take you to the course you can see the entire curriculum there all of the different topic headings all the all the different lectures you can see what the people that have taken it in our beta launch have said about it all the different people that have uh, taken the course all the way through and what they thought about it and that you can register there. So 
uh, jump in, get yourself ready, and uh, I hope to see you here again at Communication Diva. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, please share it widely. And until next time, take care and and, uh, take a listen to those words. And I'm going to try really hard not to say, you know, you know. (laughs) Talk to you soon.